One afternoon, when I was six years old, I was relaxing in a comfy chair reading a book. My older sister was sitting on the other side of the room, and she said, Mike, pass me a book. To do that, I would have to get out of my comfy chair, walk all the way across the room, about four steps, and hand her a book. Wasn't feeling it. I said, no. She asked again. But ask is a very generous word. She said, Mike, give me a book. After a couple more attempts, she altered her strategy and she appealed to a higher power. She said, Mom, Mike won't give me a book. So from the other room, I hear my mom say, Mike, give your sister a book. You know what I did? I gave it to her. I gave it to her, all right. <laughs> Airmail. Well, we are teaching through the, the biblical book of Daniel. And we took a break during the Christmas season. We're going to re-engage with Daniel. We're up to Daniel chapter 9. Today we're going to look at the first half of that. I want to pick it up. In chapter 9, verse 4, this is Daniel, and he's talking about God. He says, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. God is great and God is good. He doesn't just order and boss and rule. He loves, he guides, he cares. But the people that God had initiated a relationship with, the ancient Israelites, they had been conquered by the Babylonian Empire and they're thinking, well, if God is good and if God is great, then why were his people doing life in exile? They knew exactly why. Verse 10. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. God's rules felt restrictive. They didn't deny God's existence. They just decided, well, we want to do our own thing. We want to make our own rules. We want to do what we feel like doing. Well, that's what I did. I didn't feel like getting out of that comfy chair, so I threw the book, and it hit her, and it hurt her. Ends up my throat fractured my sister's arm. Yeah, I think that's the first time I ever remember feeling it. Shame. What did I just do? Why did I do that? No shame. I didn't like it and I couldn't shake it. When she went to the doctors, it was shame. When she came back and had her arm in a cast, shame. Every single time somebody asked, well, what happened? Shame. Shame is the word that we use to describe that feeling. And it's a feeling of weight. It's a feeling of heaviness, of guilt. And it's awful. Am I the only one who knows that feeling? Do you know what this is like? The people in Daniel 9, they sure did. Look at verse 7. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with, with what? Yeah, shame. There it is. Next verse, verse 8. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with, with what? Yeah, sh shame. There it is again. Shame is a miserable thing to feel. So what do we do with it? How can we, how can we just get rid of it? Well, here are some of the most common options for getting rid of shame and guilt in life. To hide it. We can blame it. We can feel bad about it. We can embrace it. 
I knew I was the one who caused pain. So do you know what I did? Well, I went outside so I wouldn't have to hear my sister cry. That's this. Hide it. You know, and you and I, we live in a culture that is highly conducive to hiding our shame and our guilt. Today, we can watch a YouTube video on our phone while we are Twittering that we are watching a YouTube video on our phone while we are Snapchatting with three of our friends all at the same time. If you are haunted by guilt, or if you have any, any shame in you today more than ever, we have a, so many ways to do this, to hide from it, to avoid it. We can busy ourselves using every spare moment to, to be on social media or working or hobbies or entertainment, hiding and avoiding. I'll tell you, it can work for a little while, but it's still there. At some point, that guilt, that shame is going to catch up with us. We eventually have to shut everything else off and try to go to sleep. Well, the second option for dealing with shame and guilt is, is this one. Well, blaming someone or something. Saying, well, it's not my fault. It's hers. You know, I mean, she has two legs. She could have got up out of her chair and gotten a book herself. Does this, the blame one, does that ever play in your mind? You know, thinking things like, well, I did what I did because she did what she did. If she wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have done this. It's really easy to find a reason to blame someone or something else for my behavior. But I think when we're honest and when we reflect, we know something deep down inside us knows that my behavior, it was wrong. And so we look for an excuse to try and shake off that nagging guilt. Well, it, it was just a small thing. Well, if it was such a small thing, why do you still remember it? Well, it happened a really long time ago. Well, I don't know where in the Bible it teaches that time turns wrong things into acceptable things. Well, the other person was mostly wrong. Well, even if you were only 10% wrong and they were 90% wrong, that 10%, that's still on, it's still on you. Third way to, to deal with shame or guilt is, is this just to feel bad. You ever done anything and then later you just feel bad about it? I mean, we can... We can hurt and we can cry and we can wish that we didn't do it. It can get emotional. We, we can turn it into regret. It can become depression. I feel bad. I feel bad, but feeling bad, that doesn't make it go away. And feeling bad, it doesn't get rid of it. With this option, what happens with this option, I'm aware of the pain but the emotions don't really change anything. And feeling bad, it can be misfocused. It's like, I felt bad. All right, we'll dig a little deeper. Why did I feel bad? Well, not because that incident got me in touch with my own inner laziness. I think the reason I felt bad was because the consequences made me feel uncomfortable. That was the reason I felt bad. You know, I, I didn't like the result. Well, my, my husband is leaving me. My kid doesn't trust me. People don't respect me anymore. Well, why? Well, because of this behavior and this behavior and this behavior. Let me share an example of this with you. When my son Caleb was about four years old, he lost dessert privileges because of some poor choices that he made during dinner. He felt bad. I mean, his little lip was trembling and well, his 
tears were welling up in his eyes, and he looked at me and said, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. And I said, well, for what? what? What are you sorry for, Caleb? And here's how he responded. He said, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I just really want dessert. <laughs> Got to give the little guy some honesty points. But this can happen. We can do this kind of thing. We can feel bad. And then kind of pat ourselves on the back because it's like, well, I feel bad about that. I've got a conscience. Well, we, we feel bad. We feel sorry about the consequences we face. We can do that without really dealing with the offense that is in us. Doesn't work. Then there's this one. Embrace it. To say, this, this, this behavior, this is who I am. I'm just going to accept this about me. And we can say that, but yet even if it comes out of our mouth, maybe not internally feel that. Something in us still knows, well, it's not right. And this can take a lot of different forms and shapes. And counselors talk a lot about how they're working people and unpacking these things in, in deep areas of their life. It can come out saying things like, well, I don't like myself. I feel worthless. I'm not good for anything. I don't deserve love. We may sabotage our body with food or drinking or cutting. We may enter into bad relationship after bad relationship after bad relationship. This, it's a rather dark way to do life. I want to show you something that puts all of this into perspective for me. Take a look. This is a, a lion that just killed a baby zebra. And I'm not the bad guy here. I didn't kill the zebra. Right? I'm just showing the picture. Nature is ruthless. Do you think this lion is feeling guilty? Is he thinking, man, I really shouldn't have done that. It was just a baby. No way. This lion, he's gnawing on its head. Zero guilt. So why do we? Why do we? Have you ever considered it? Why is it that we humans feel the weight of shame and of guilt? Why does nothing else in all creation feel what we feel? God tells us why. Genesis 1, 27, he says, this, this is you. You need to know this about yourself. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. If it's really just survival of the fittest, then how do you explain shame? The other creatures don't experience that one. See, human shame and guilt, these are very difficult things for atheists to explain because they point to a moral authority and they point to an absolute truth and they point toward a spiritual reality, toward the existence of God. Why shame? Why guilt? Here's why. Because I'm not a lion. That's why. Because I have been created in the image of a good and a loving and a holy God. There is something hardwired in you and in me that recognizes I hurt someone. I violated something. I messed up. And that, that's what's going on in Daniel chapter 9, that's where the people are at. Check it out, verse 5. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. They acknowledge it's not all good. There are things that we did 
that are wrong. Well, says who? Who defines good and bad? Who defines right and wrong? What's the baseline? What's the standard? Verse 8, we and our kings, our princes and our ancestors are covered with shame. Lord, read the rest of this with me. Because we have sinned against you. That's really important in understanding this passage in the Bible. It's so important in here. They said the same thing a second time. Verse 11, we have sinned against you. Notice here, who is it that they've sinned against? It's God. They're saying, God, you're the one that we've actually sinned against. Ultimately, our sin is sin because it is against God. It is against the way that he has created and designed things. Whenever you or I do things like lose our temper or deceive our parents or break a promise or throw a book at our sister, the underlying reason why those things are wrong are because it's not just survival of the fittest. There is a God and we have, well, we have offended him. We can hide it and we can blame uh, something else for it or we could feel bad about it. We can embrace it and say, well, this is my identity. God offers a different alternative. Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. The majority of Daniel chapter 9 what is this. It's a big old confession. To confess, it's to own up to the fact that, well, my behavior was wrong. To confess is to agree with God. To confess is to admit, I have violated God and I violated his ways. To confess is simply to share it with God and call it what God calls it, sin. But sometimes we think, you know, but, but if I share this with God, then he's going to be mad. Think that through. He knows, right? He already knows it's not like God is going to say something like, what? You're kidding me. The, the two of you aren't married and you did what? I had no idea. He knows. See, there's a common misunderstanding with Confession. Confession isn't us share, you know, sharing our dirty little secrets with God because confession, it's not primarily for God. Confession, it is primarily for us, for this. Because these, hide it, blame it, feel bad about it, embrace it, don't work. These, they don't solve the problem. They don't take away the sin. They don't remove the guilt. If you want to have inner peace, if you want to live a life without shame, without guilt, well, we don't need an excuse. What we need is forgiveness from the one that we've offended, God. And that, that's why we talk about Jesus so much. That, that's why he came. He came to give his life on the cross for any and for all sin. There is nothing that you can do that he won't forgive, which means there's nothing that we can't and shouldn't confess. Confession, I, I don't know what your experience with that is, but I hope that you see it this way. I hope that you see it in this light. The way that God designed confession is for us to see it as this, a wonderful, amazing gift. It's God saying, we don't need to be self-righteous. 
We don't need to be arrogant. We don't need to get defensive. We don't need to fake it and pretend. We don't need to live with shame or with guilt or in hiddenness. We can be honest because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead to forgive, remove, erase, cleanse, and set us free. Daniel chapter 9, it's really just one big old confession. Daniel is confessing his sins and the collective sins of the nation. He's not hiding it. He's not blaming it. He's not feel it, just feeling bad about it. He's not embracing it, saying, oh, this is my identity. No, what he's doing is taking responsibility for it and sharing that with God. So we're not just going to talk about this. We're going to do it here and, and now. First, we'll read a corporate confession together. And then we'll create a little space just for you and for God. And reflect and listen and share. You know, confess to him. Be specific with him. And I think that you'll discover that this can be a very life-giving, freeing thing to do. Let's confess. I'll start. Lord, we come to you to confess our sins, to ask for your forgiveness. We often consider ourselves to be pretty good people, but sometimes overestimate our goodness. Join me. We tend to judge others and think of ourselves as better than they are. We are eager to take care of ourselves, but often ignore the needs of others. Join me. We are saddened and even horrified by the things happening around the world, but don't do anything about them. We choose to set our eyes on things below rather than things above. We honor our own comfort and pleasure before honoring God, join me. We have not done what is good and right, but what the world said would make us happy. We are sorry. Lord, turn our eyes away from ourselves and on to you. Join me. Forgive us our sins and purify our heart, soul, mind, and will. Go. Share with him. Confessing our sins is something that has become highly countercultural today. But it's something that the followers of Jesus have been doing for a couple thousand years. And I invite you to find ways to just weave this into your daily rhythm. Because confessing our sins, it connects us to God in some really deep and profound and powerful ways. Are you ready to hear the best part? <laughs> hear what the Bible says to those who are followers of Jesus. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, it says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we're honest with God, he doesn't shame us. 
He doesn't reject us. He purifies us. He makes us clean. He makes us new. And read this one with me. This was from Isaiah. This is God speaking. Join me. It says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. Gone, over, forgotten, forgiven. If you entrust your life to Jesus, God, he forgives you. Now, forgive yourself. Let it go. If it comes back, you don't have to confess the same sin again and again and again and again. Memorize a passage like this one in Isaiah. He says, it's gone. I've forgotten it. Let it go. One more. Join me. Let's read this one together from Colossians chapter 1. It says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's not hide it or blame it or feel bad about it or embrace it. That's forgiven, erased, removed, gone. Confession is a wonderful gift because when we confess, we experience firsthand just how good and how gracious our God truly is.